Bill DeSimone, personal trainer since 1983, ACE certified for the last 20 years, and the author of Joint Friendly Fitness and a few other things. And this is my breakdown of long length partials. Now, I don't expect to affect influencers and their following, or magazine editorial decisions, or the direction of academic exercise research. But for you as an exerciser or a trainer, especially if your priority is to keep your joints healthy, this breakdown may help you decide whether this approach has substance or if it's more of a meme. Here are my three main issues with long length partials. Number one, if you're weight training at all, even with the most basic fundamental exercises and routine, you're already using the science behind put a muscle on stretch to generate force. Number two, if you overdo or misinterpret loading the so-called long length, you put your joints into clear mechanisms for instability and injury. And number three, now I'm not an academic, but the hype around the studies seems more convincing than the actual content. I think they're ignoring some fundamental aspects of biomechanics like moment arms and muscle torque, which would consistently explain the results. And I also think people are trying to use an interpretation of the hype of the studies, not the actual content. I should probably elaborate. In my 50 plus years of exercise and 40 plus of personal training, I've seen a pattern repeat. A phrase from a textbook or a paper gets lifted and interpreted. And then every time the phrase gets used by a trainer, a writer, now an influencer, another interpretation gets tacked on, until eventually the common use of the phrase bears little resemblance to the original very specific meaning. The phrase comes to mean whatever the user says it means. And if you don't give lip service to the phrase, you're accused of not being up on the science. Full range of motion, functional training, Tabata protocol, just to name a few examples. Which brings us to the current one, long length partials. Here's the men's health article from November 2023, which touts the technique, tries to explain it, gives some instruction, and lists some studies for support. Quote, increase hypertrophy in a hurry with this bodybuilding technique, says new research. And new evidence, newest intensity technique, new research. Okay, this is hype. The intensity technique called burns has been around the muscle magazine since at least the 1960s. More important is this claim of new evidence. The old muscle magazines would periodically run articles that said, science tells us a muscle has to be stretched to generate the most force. And then they'd show pictures of stiff-legged deadlifts on a bench or dumbbell pullovers across a bench or rock bottom squats or an extreme dumbbell chest fly and so on except that this is not what science said, except in a very specific context. From the textbook, Basic Biomechanics of the Musculoskeletal System, 2012, the length tension curve with the sliding filament model, a very standard piece of physiology, a clue to where the idea of stretch the muscle to generate more force comes from. Let's take a better look. From the textbook, Exercise Physiology by McCardle, Catch and Catch, 2015. Now the segmented curve, the yellow, is called active tension. The vertical axis is tension or muscle force. The horizontal axis is length with the shortest length at the left. Now, starting at the right of the graph, the muscle is at its longest length. As you move your eyes left, you see counterclockwise in boxes on top are diagrams of cross bridges from no overlap to optimal overlap to fully overlapped. As the muscle shortens, so you're moving right to left on the graph, the force generated by the muscle at that length is plotted, and this creates the active tension curve. And what you see here is that the force a muscle is capable of increases, plateaus, and decreases 
This is standard muscle physiology. So the stretch position, the longest length, does not help the muscle generate the most force unless you start at the other end. If you start from the left, the fully shortened, fully overlapped position, and stretch the muscle from there, yes, that helps the muscle generate more force by putting it on a stretch. Stretch from fully contracted. Once you pass that plateau, the active tension curve decreases again. Now there's another aspect to stretching a muscle too far. Now these graphs elaborate on the previous. Brunstrom's clinical kinesiology, basic biomechanics again, and on the right from joint structure and function in 1992. They discuss the same active tension curve, but they elaborate on what happens when you load the stretch. So if you compel a muscle to resist the load, like when you're doing the negative portion of a rep, the active tension is still going to increase as you come out of fully shortened, then plateau. But the more you lengthen away from the plateau, the more passive tension kicks in. Passive tension comes from the, quote, non-contractile elements of a muscle fiber. So it functions like a defense mechanism. If you can lift it, you can lower it, and you can probably lower more because passive tension will kick in. But if you're going out of your way to load the long lengths of a muscle, are you really working on something you can use, the active tension? Or are you just experimenting with the limits of passive tension? Keeping in mind there's only one way to know that limit, it breaks. Now, when you read past those sections in the textbooks, they tell you a few more things. One is that the pattern of force is the same at every level of organization within a muscle. So you don't have a rogue sarcomere or fiber doing its own thing. Two is that those curves apply to individual fibers. When you looked at intact muscle joint systems, an internal moment arm is created the joints themselves have limitations, so you work with a usable muscle torque curve for a specific limb movement. And three, the body naturally avoids putting muscles into the extreme short or extreme long position because the positions are so biomechanically weak they're not useful. The exercise world, of course, takes that as a challenge, but that's the reality. So if you train with the most basic weight training routine like the ones here, and didn't put any extra thought into long length or short length positions. During your reps, your body would naturally avoid the long or short lengths, the insufficiencies, and it would naturally lengthen your contracted muscles enough to stay in the optimal ranges for force. And so the resistance would directly create overload where you can create your greatest muscular effort. Speaking of ranges, now a few pages into the article, they discuss how to determine the long length and the best exercises to use with this technique. Quote, to figure out if a muscle is at long length, think about which half of the range of motion stretches the muscle the most, and that's the half you want. Now, there's too much to unpack in that sentence, so let's just take it as is. But remember earlier I said about overdoing or misinterpreting the long lengths. Now, down the center is their list. On the sides is mine. A couple of exercises don't make my list. Biceps curls and preacher curls to start. I don't see any benefit to doing this technique here, but no harm either. And skull crushers, well, what else is it there to add? I'll cover those three exercises when I look at the studies. And as for the purists out there, I'm using their labels. I do know that biceps is plural and triceps is plural and chests don't fly. Let's look at the impingements first. From the article, the issue is with the bottom position. If you follow the instructions here, start by hanging freely with straight arms, pull yourself up by flexing the elbows while pinching your shoulder blades together. That's fine, but it implies that you do the reverse on the negative. So as you approach the bottom, if you release your shoulder blades, the load is going to pull your shoulders up towards your ears. Sports medicine textbooks call this the humerus migrating upward, and it creates impingement, which leads to tendonitis, bursitis, oleitis. 
probably not an instant injury, but you put yourself in the mechanism for a future injury. And not only that, but the joint angle for peak muscle torque for the lats isn't even near the dead hang position, so your effort isn't going to overload the lats. Now this applies to pull downs, chin ups, pull ups, or any overhead pull where the negative pulls the shoulders upward. With rows, impingement isn't the concern, even though you retract and release the scapula, because the arm is moving forward, not upward. The concern is with the spine. So on the left page and the center page, the X photos, that's what loading the spine and flexion looks like. That's a standard contraindication for spine health, so if you're aware of it, you try not to do it. If you're not aware of it, or if you can't see yourself in a mirror, at the end of the negative, it's hard to distinguish between letting your scapula out and allowing your thoracic spine to slip into flexion. Again, probably not an acute injury, just more wear and tear on the spine, and nowadays people spend enough time in that posture. On the right, a row station with the chest support is the most direct way to prevent this. Next on the list, three different exercises, three different ways to tempt fate. The side raises are very direct. At the bottom, if you let your arm press into your ribs, the brunt of the work shifts from the side deltoid to the supraspinatus of the rotator cuff. And while working the rotator cuff may not be a bad idea, a weight that's right for the larger deltoids risks straining the smaller supraspinatus, which in turn means an unstable shoulder. Now back to the article. Dumbbell flies are a manageable exercise, but doing them this way is really inviting injury. Quote, when you struggle to bring the dumbbells up, complete three to six long length partials. Your pectorals are already so fatigued that you can't get to the easy part of the rep. So you can only be where the leverage is maximum in favor of the weights. If you lose control at the bottom, the ligaments in your shoulder are in a very vulnerable position. The joint is abducted, externally rotated, and hyperextended. This is a potentially acute injury. Uh, now, the overhead triceps extension. This is complex because it involves scapulohumeral rhythm, active insufficiency, and the shoulder ligaments. Briefly, if you let the weight bend the elbow as far as it can go, the triceps would be stretched over both the elbow and the shoulder joint. This is a classic textbook example of a muscle stretched over two joints and going into active insufficiency. What can happen, the triceps goes taut, the body tries to shift the scapula to relieve the stretch, which they call a form of tenodesis or tendon action of muscle, only the muscles stabilizing the scapula are already engaged because of the overhead position, and the extra strain can put them in spasm. There are much less involved ways of working the triceps. One last one from the article. Yes, I've heard there's some content claiming that the deep position on the left is a great idea for your knees. This article also suggests drop your thighs until they are at least parallel to the floor implying that lower is better. And I don't doubt that squatting this low, especially between full reps, will make your thighs burn, make that dumbbell feel very heavy, and make you do more mechanical work each rep. But there's a patella involved. The patella's job is to keep the line of force from the quads away from the center axis of the knee. This creates an internal moment arm, and so your quads are stronger than they would be without a patella. Now, when the knee is bent in the more upright position, like on the right, the patella deflects the force from the quads. The more the knee is bent, the left, the more the patella absorbs the forces. But there's a limit to how much compression it can take. You can either run up to that limit doing this in the gym or doing things in the real world. That's up to you. I don't see in the anatomy what structure they think adapts positively to the deep knee bend position. In spite of the burning, it's not the quads. That center graph is from a paper, Predictive Torque Equations, which plots joint angle versus muscle torque for major movements. Zero degrees is a straight knee. 
So you see peak torque for knee extension at about 80 degrees. That is much closer to the upright position than the deep position. The deep position is 135 degrees, maybe more. So if you're trying to overload the quads, you're better off working around the 80 degree position. So you fatigue them where they're strongest and where the knee is less vulnerable. The deeper angle makes for a much more dramatic picture though, so clicks. So far, I'm not a fan of the approach. I don't see the physiology behind it. Stretching a muscle from contracted to generate more force is not the same as stretching it as far as it can go, which is not necessarily the same as the first half of a rep. It's also not the same as loading a joint past where it functions safely, as I showed with the exercises. What about the studies? Well, first, these are some of the studies and the textbooks with bibliographies full of studies that I use to learn how healthy muscles and joints work and how injuries happen, which I then apply to exercises in books like Joint Friendly Fitness and this YouTube channel. These studies on the left are from the Men's Health article and elsewhere. From the top, leg extension station, lying triceps, heel raises, and biceps curls. In the next video, I'll go through these to see if there's anything useful for an exerciser or a trainer. Not in the hype, not in an interpretation, but in the actual content. I'll also discuss the paper on the right and why I think that material and moment arms are what's actually being observed in the long length studies.